Hi everybody and welcome to the Coaches Rising podcast and in this video I'm going to be speaking with John Prendergast and well he wrote a book which I read last year and I loved it. It's called In Touch and um, well John's um, he's a long time spiritual practitioner and more recently a teacher. He studied with uh, for a long time with Jean Klein and more recently with Adyashanti and he, he's a therapist and he's been guiding students and um, I read his book and it, it really lit me up um, because there's something I've been exploring in my coaching that I call being a, a transformational presence, being a transformational presence and it's this space beyond our tools and training and our coaching persona, the part of us that wants to get it right and get results. Um, it's this space we can move into in deep presence where we we meet in intimacy and immediacy and uh, and something can begin to emerge between us it's very magical and well John's book really spoke to me about this and so in this session we're going to be exploring some really cool topics which I think are very rich for coaches John's going to point out what he calls inner knowing and it's very different from our kind of analytical thinking mind's way of knowing. Um, he's going to also talk about when we start to, 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 to grow and to wake up, the space that we can move into beyond our usual kind of strategic, will-based way of creating in the world. It's a much more kind of authentic purpose that we can start to access. And um, there's a lot more kind of flow inside of it I think that's a rich topic for coaches so you know and this this topic is we, we, we explore some things which are quite far outside of what we would normally explore in a coaches rising kind of session so I feel a bit vulnerable about that you know because um, I don't know how you guys are going to take it but um, I hope you're going to love it because you know this topic I think is is beautiful and, and um, lights me up so um Enjoy. I guess I just, I, I guess I'd love to start by asking you about um, inner knowing, this sense of inner knowing, and what what that is for you. Like, what's your experience of that? Um, I mean, you wrote about it so beautifully, but yeah, maybe you could just share me share with me from your experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even though, uh, you know, we can write about it and talk about it, it's actually very difficult to describe. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> what can I say? You know, we're ordinarily very identified with our thinking and our feeling and our action, you know, as conditioned human beings. And, uh, you know, the kind of the strategic mind is very active in terms of observing and analyzing and planning and all of which is very useful in terms of problem solving and trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain and keep the species going. Um, meanwhile, in the background, generally unrecognized, there is awareness, this kind of awake, knowing presence. And our, uh, our attention is, you know, on our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and behaviors. And unknowingly, there is this awareness. So um, <clears throat> many people go through their lives completely uh, unaware of it, uh, working from it unconsciously or unknowingly. And um, at some point, either by accident or intention, either because of suffering or, you know, a deep desire for the truth, we begin to inquire what is this that's aware? What is this that's always here? You know, and, and so we can refer to this as a knowing, you know, a knowing presence that has a quality of being and of knowing and of loving too. Uh, so uh, rather than developing ourselves in a, in a more linear and horizontal way, uh, developing the mind and body and refining feelings, this exploration is really uh, kind of a backward step, a falling back, uh, a recognition of what is always here. Uh, and it, uh, the experience of it is of a tremendous openness and vast space. Uh, it feels actually infinite. 
um, one feels unbounded in that, and uh, and uh, as this deepens, there's a, there's an opening of the heart as well. There's a quality of love. There's a quality of intimacy um, with life, really, and with everyone. So it has that quality of immediacy and intimacy that you were um, referring to mm-hmm. before, and. And just a kind of intrinsic happiness and joy and uh, gratitude and appreciation as well. And because the mind isn't, as this awareness comes more into the foreground, we're less and less kind of goal-oriented in a way. We're really more and more just here, open, available, which is actually a very creative space. You know, it's not a, it's not a passive awareness. It's actually very lively, full of potential. Um, and in that sense, very creative. And I think as human beings, we have these two aspects, this kind of open awareness that accepts everything as it is, and then this movement of creative potential as well. And so to awaken to uh, who we are fundamentally and then live from that, to embody it more and more deeply, is deeply satisfying uh, and gratifying and rewarding way of living, whether, you know, it's in our work or in our personal relationships. So, you know, how is it for me? It's a sense of uh, um, openness, a sense of um, joy, a sense of intimacy, a sense of freedom. Um, Yeah, all of that. (laughs) Well, I, I, I love what you're talking about. And I think um, it touches something inside of me, um, this process I've been going through where, um, you know, like there's a sense of how this, this movement, I guess, you talk about down from, from the head. And for me, this sense of being in control and being in my mind and, and like thinking that I can per- perhaps like really predict and control the future and through a force of will kind of make it happen. And, mm-hmm. and but un- underneath, I mean, underneath that is this inner knowing. But but in a way, separating that is a lot of fear and contraction. Exactly. <laughs> that that's exactly it. There's um, I find that fear, you know, fear and shame, are generally the biggest obstacles to really um, discovering and living from this inner knowing, which is different than you know more conventional strategic knowing, and it is a drop. You know, it's a shift, you know, it's, I, I speak of this as the great pilgrimage, you know, the journey of attention dropping from here about nine inches, you know, into the heart area. But it's not just the heart, it's actually the whole torso, the interior of the body, this, this native sensitivity we have as well. And so it's a much quieter, it doesn't, this knowing is much quieter, you know, the still small voice is sometimes used to describe it. Um, as well. And so it requires the noise of the system uh, diminish. And that noise has a lot to do with fear, doesn't it? And it has a lot to do with that fear of trying to control and of losing control mm. as well. So it's a very, it's, a, it's really quite a big shift. Uh, it's a kind of surrender of the conventional knowing, you know, and that, that trying to grasp with the mind, as you were suggesting, mm. and trusting a deeper intelligence that's uh, native within ourself and within life itself. So it's, it's a whole surrendering to a different way of being and a different way of knowing. Yeah. yeah and, and it's radical. Mm-hmm. And, and it generally takes some time and a lot of honesty and vulnerability too. Mm-hmm. You know, a willingness to really experience what's here and to face our fear and go through our shame and acknowledge our lack of control over you know, major events in our life as well. Mm. And yet, interestingly, it's also empowering, you know, in a, in a way that's surprising to the mind. Uh, I guess that because on the other side of that process, you know, of, of the, the, the fear and the, the recognizing maybe that we're not in control in the way we thought we were. And uh, that's kind of terif- that's been terrifying for myself on one level. You know, it's like everything else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But but then coming through that in some way, then I think maybe we can start to see there's a relief or there's a there's a kind of um, uh, an increased propensity or capacity for intimacy with what is arising. 
Yes. Yeah, that's it's very true. There is a deep sense of relief, you know, and and this is something that I wrote about, you know, in my book that there are these markers, you know, kind of somatic markers, these internal sensations that let us know we're on the right track, you know, that we're actually honing in on the truth of who we really are. And one of them is a core relaxation. It's very interesting. There's it's like we walk around unknowingly with a grip, internal grip, and it has to do with that trying to control usually through trying to know as well. And as there is a, a letting go of that grip and a softening, there's a shift of attention inwardly and, and a sense of greater aliveness and alignment internally and also yeah. like a letting go, like a whew, you know, and uh, a sense of more groundedness, interestingly, and uh, along with sense of space and, and open-heartedness. So definitely a sense of relief mm. uh, to not, to not try to control something that we can't, and to not try to know something that we can't either. Yeah, well, I, I want to ask you about the these um, these kind of signals or uh, okay. kind of attributes of, of this inner knowing, um, this you know internal signs of that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to first just ask you a little bit about about how you work with people and, and the the context. I'll just kind of. Uh, Give a bit of context of my own experience again. Um, I guess the the feeling I often had was of like being a coach who, um, you know, is going to use my mind and my professional training and tools, and I'm going to, um, you know, like be with this person, and and we're going to like hash it out together, and we're going to get to that place, and um, it never quite worked out like that, and I think. Mm -hmm the the transition i'm going through is one of of um surrendering that that almost that kind of persona of being the 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 professional coach and 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 mm -hmm. beginning to meet my clients in a kind of um intimacy that i just mentioned but it's like we're being almost being co-created in this moment so um mm -hmm. this trusting that there's this knowingness, which in your book you so beautifully write about, that um, if we if we relinquish the need to know everything and to find an answer, which you know in coaching I think can be a real trap for coaches, and I've fallen into a lot. Like I've I've got to help sure. my client get to that place, right? And and so uh, you know, trusting that if we let go in this moment, that there's something deeper can emerge. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. You, you speak very beautifully about it, Joel. And it's a delight, actually, to hear you <laughs> describe it. Because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I think it's something everyone goes through. You know, at first, there's, a, you know, you want to be the helper. You want to be the expert. You want to give value, you know. And, and so you're strategizing and bringing your knowledge and your expertise and dialoguing and so on. But there's this whole other way of being together, you know, and, and trusting and unfolding you know, a conversation in the moment mm. uh, that's very attuned, you know, with one another. It's a true conversation, right? Like we're having right yeah. now. And we can feel that, right? There's yeah. like this shared presence, even though, you know, you're whatever, 8,000 miles away or, you know, you know, you're in Europe, you know, here I am in California. And yet there's this surprising intimacy, you know, and, and sense of shared presence and um, an attunement with being, I would say. Yeah. And, and this is the field of, you know, real creative, real creativity and real exploration of potential yeah. too. And, and it's an unfolding, you know, rather than a, you know, a, a directed goal oriented direction. It's really an unfolding and a deepening in the moment as well. And it, and it brings a feeling of um, great intimacy and, and uh, surprise as well. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I love that you point that out because I do feel in touch with something now. And it's like there's a kind of there is a there is a kind of um, alignment or a, a vibrancy I'm feeling and um, like everything's alive. Like you mentioned aliveness. And I, I feel is. that. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. in my own experience, I've had to get used to the sort of experiential intensity of this to some degree um, mm. to, to, because the, the fear of the unknown 
at some point it kind of translate it shifts into excitement or aliveness you know if i can exactly. conduct it that's that's exactly what it is again beautifully said there's a kind of transformation that happens we go through a kind of barrier of fear and we discover the opposite of what we fear you know it's like we fear losing control and what will happen usually we're afraid of dying but what we find is a tremendous aliveness here <laughs> It's the opposite of what the mind thinks. You know, it's to the mind, this is all a very paradoxical process, but it's directly experiential. You know, and this is the beauty of this knowing: is it's known, um, you know, it's, it's known more and more intimately and without doubt to be this vibrant, alive presence uh, as well. And it's it's deeply, yeah, it can be, um, you know, if we're used to being in the mind and strategizing and problem solving. You know, this dimension of intimacy and connection can be somewhat overwhelming. And it brings up a lot of our old insecurities. You were mentioning vulnerability at the, at mm -hmm. the beginning. It's like, well, what happens, you know, if I'm not trying to maintain an image, right? If I'm not protecting or projecting some kind of image, you know, if I'm just open, you know, just completely open with this other being, if I let myself be seen, you know, and so all of our core stories will also come up. Uh, generally one point or another of not being enough or something being wrong with us as well and we can feel that kind of ooh, you know too close you know yeah. so relational the whole relational dynamic uh, comes into play as yeah. well and it's important right it's very important if we're interested in real if, if we're really dedicated to authenticity to being real you know and I think that's what this is all about it's about being real you yeah know? then then there's a kind of nakedness that's asked of us, right, and a kind of intimacy. Why well, I like I like what you just said because there was a shift in my own process a while ago where I felt like I was a little and and again you've written about this where I was I was caught in quite a lot of bypassing and um, you know doing my practices in order to in a way certainly to to escape the moment to kind of get to that place of peace or whatever it was where one day everything would be okay and That's right. yeah <laughs> which never came. I, did, I, did, I did years of those practices <laughs> but, it, but it, i think what yeah what you said was like uh, it, it suddenly it became for me about intimacy that was it so you say being real and that's that's like it was just like i don't i just want to be intimate with what's here like i just don't i don't want to try to escape or to get away and that that kind of transition seem to uh, open up a new phase of my kind of my unfolding. It's a very different way of being, right? Because it's, it's not really, uh, the shift becomes rather than trying to feel better, it's like we want to be real, you know? We're more interested in the truth of our experience than in being comfortable as well. And that was true for me. I mean, I, you know, in my 20s, I was doing, I was teaching meditation, doing long meditation courses. You know, there was a, there was a desire to know, but maybe as important was the desire to be at peace or be a comfortable or be at ease socially to resolve an inner anxiety that I wasn't really facing. And then at some point, suddenly there was a shift and I just became more interested in just knowing, you know, what's true and just being with what is rather than subtly escaping uh, as well. And, and so it's a gradual process, but it's a very important shift. Uh, and it's a shift into, I think, real adulthood and real maturity as well. Well, well what you say there, I think, because I connect that back to coaching in the sense of a lot of the time people, I think, are, um, you know, they're looking for certain kinds of success in their lives, but it's coming through maybe insecurity or the, trying to live into an image in some way. And so it has this kind of inauthenticity or sense of will that's forced and it never quite works. And so this is why I think your work is important for coaches too, because I think it points towards this process of, yeah, that we can, that we can wake up and we can uh, wake, wake up to this knowingness and this potentiality and then, and then kind of create from that place. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So much of our doing you know, unconsciously is trying to prove or disprove something in terms of our value. In other words, most of us walk around with an implicit sense of lack, 
right? We may not be able to verbalize it, but there's just a feeling of something missing, you know, and so we need to prove ourselves, you know, we need to prove our value or we need to disprove that we're lacking something, you know, it's the compensatory personality. And, uh, you know, you see it, all, we see it within ourselves and around us as well, the constant need for validation, you know, the constant need for some kind of positive reinforcement. Well, it's interesting to then be, begin to question, what's the motive here? You know, what am I really wanting? That's such an important question to sit with again and again. What's most important? You know, what is it that I really value? So what if I get that? What if I do get that position? What if that project does get completed? What if I do get, you know, whatever, the money, you know, the status, then what? Right? What, am I, what is it that I really want? It's a very, very important question. And when we sit with it and go deeply, it begins to take us to, to what we're talking about. It's actually, I want to be, I really want to be just as I am. You know, I want to be free. I want to be real. I want to be intimate. You know, this is what I want. And the interesting thing is, it's all here now, already. This is the great paradox to the mind, is what we're seeking is already present, but overlooked. And so it's a matter of, it's a shift of understanding and of attention from going out to get what we think we want to actually questioning, is it true that it's not here already? You know, that the core of what I am looking for is already present and in fact is what I am, right? The one who's looking, you know, this awareness is actually the treasure, you know, unrecognized as well. There's a story uh, I, kind of a teaching story, uh, old from India, of a beggar who sits by the side of the road outside of a city, and he's sitting on a, a box, and you know he's been doing it for years, and he holds out his hand, and you know every once in a while someone comes by and gives him a, a rupee. You know, one day uh, a fellow walks by, and he's you know kind of old guy with his stick, and he stops in front of the beggar, and the beggar puts out his hand. He doesn't give him any money. But he takes a stick and he taps the box and he says, have you ever looked under your box? And then he leaves, you know, the old man leaves and the, the beggar gets up and lifts the box. And of course, there it is, the treasure, right? right? The pile of gold. You know, we're kind of like those beggars, you know, and we may be dressed in our business suits and, you know, driving in our sports cars. But, um, you know, the gold is already here and 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 yet it requires uh, a stripping away, a humility, you know, it's not, it's not like the ego gets the gold, right? It's more the seeing through uh, of the ego and the egoic project and a surrendering to a natural kind of radiance and fullness that's been, it's here, but, but unrecognized. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, I, I love that story. I want to ask you, um, I want to kind of go in a different direction and ask you also about how, what is it you do when you're sat with your clients? So I'm curious, like when you, when you, when somebody comes in, you know, for a session, you've been a, a psychotherapist and a, and a kind of, uh, you have your own students as well. Uh, like they come and sit with you. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing in that moment? What are you looking for or, um, or, or asking or, yeah. Get my question. Well, um, typically I say very little, you know, I mean, there may be a, you know, hello, how are you? But often uh, we like to just sit in silence for uh, maybe two, three minutes. Not that we have to, it's not required. I don't even have the intention to, but often when, you know, when I work with my students and my clients and many of my clients are interested in this approach, you know, we'll, we'll just sit quietly for a little while and they'll say something like, I just want to settle in and kind of feel what wants to, what wants to come up or what wants attention. And, and so I'm just sitting in silence. The mind's very quiet. I don't have an agenda. I don't have a question, you know, we're just being together. And, um, and then there's a, when people say, I don't know what to talk about. I say, that's perfect. <laughs> that's the best. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so in other words, there's a, there's a surrendering to not knowing at the beginning very often either in silence or in words and and uh, but you know everyone's different and it depends on what they're wanting as well so i'm not directive in that way but 
there's a listening that's happening, okay? So there's just a natural sort of attunement that happens. I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm resting here, you know, there's not a sense of leaving or going anywhere. It's more of a receiving, as I'm receiving you right now. It's yeah. like there's a, 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 there's a meeting that's happening in silence. It's like I'm taking you in, right, as you're taking me in. So we're taking each other in, you know, in, in silence, but often eyes open. There may be a little bit quiet gazing that happens, just an innocent looking, uh, a co-meditative gazing that may go on for a minute or two. It's, it's very innocent. It's unforced. It's not strategic. It's not trying to get make something happen. It's just part of that meeting of connecting. And then there's a dropping in that happens very spontaneously. It's like we both begin to fall in to a deeper space together. And then almost always, it's really clear what it is that wants to be expressed out of that kind of openness as well. It may be a question, maybe there's a little bit of sharing. It's a very dynamic and creative process uh, as well. And you know, you, you've read my books, so you know I'm, I'm very sensitive, you know, energet energetically and emotionally. So I'm tracking all of that in my own body. You know, I'm, and yet not getting lost in it. And sometimes I may say something, sometimes I won't. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe because every session is, you know, is kind of different. But th I would say it's a co-exploration of what's true in the moment, you know, and what's alive and what's, what's wanting attention. So sometimes they'll say, what's wanting attention right now? Don't think about it, right? Often I'll say, you know, I'll pose a question and say, but don't think about it. Just sit with the question, you know, and let it work on you. And then we'll sit for a little while. And then something will start bubbling up. It's like we're both trusting this intrinsic intelligence and con connection, you know, that we both share. What's also important is, like, I'm not sitting as an expert. It's like I don't know what's right. right. I don't know where we're supposed to be going. I don't know what's supposed to be happening. And I feel very at ease in that. It's like I, I don't have something to prove either or disprove. It's like it's we're here to share space and and uh, and to creatively explore, you know, what is it that's alive and what is real. Yeah, I love that. I think yeah, it just again it, it inspires me with the, the the thing I was saying before about uh, mm -hmm. like dropping that need to be an expert because I think that's the sort of thing that can um, kill the intimacy. Um, um, it can, you know, letting go of the need for an outcome in some way, because in, that kind of can um, shape where the inquiry goes or where your consciousness is kind of looking and it excludes other possibilities. It seems to kind of close down. It okay. shuts everything down and it narrows it down. And that's, that's what we generally do in our conversations, you know, whether they're, you know, whether it's with a coaching student, you know, or a client or, or just a friend. You know, it's very interesting to just see how the mind looks for, you know, a subject, right? <laughs> now we have something to talk about. You know, why is that? Because we're uncomfortable just being in silence, right? So this it kind of it gets back to that. You know, it's like the mind is busy looking for handholds and footholds, some kind of footing, you know, so it knows, okay, I'm safe, I'm here. But when it, it becomes much more innocent, you know, and... And we're just here, you know, and we're open, and and uh, then then the magic happens. <laughs> you know, then, then, then life life begins to unfold through us and between us, right? In in sometimes really surprising and almost always deeply touching ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can feel that now, you know, like the, there's like something bubbling up inside of me, and uh, as you speak. You know, it's like my being responds and there's like this feeling of like an internal yes or something like there's a there's a truth to to what you're saying. Yeah, isn't it interesting? This is the phenomenon of resonance. You know, it's like that in that in us, which uh, loves the truth and knows the truth responds when we hear it and feel it expressed in someone else. Yeah. It's very, you know, and it's enlivening. It's a very interesting phenomena, this resonance. And it's, it's, it's how spiritual teachers work, you know, genuine ones, authentic ones as well, and why we respond to, to people who have that, you know, natural presence, 
as well. Uncontrived, non-strategic um, presence. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, there's so many questions that are, are coming up. Um, I think I I want to I want to ask you about sort of transmission, but I want to wait for a little bit about that. I want to um, I want to ask you now about your sensitivity because that's something that really struck me reading your book was mm -hmm. that you are very sensitive you just mentioned this before mm -hmm. um, and you also talk about the energy body in your book and I think that's something that if, if ten mm -hmm. to five ten ten years ago I would have been very skeptical about there being such a thing mm -hmm. and um, through my own practices have really started to experience something like that and <clears throat> I think it's really important. Like, I think what you point to in your writing is really important for for people that do want to work skillfully with other people. I wonder if you could talk to me about the energy body and your your sensitivity, because you, I mean, you, like, you, I think you feel things on a very refined level when you're with someone. So. Yeah, yeah, I do, and it's something that's evolved over time. And I think it, I probably had this capacity as a child, although I wasn't really aware of it. You know, I, I write about this a little bit in my book. It was, it would mostly come, um, I remember when I was 10 years old, period of kind of age 10 to 13, and uh, many nights I would start falling asleep and then I would just have these, kind of go into a hypnagogic or waking dream state uh, in which I just felt the body, you know, extremely kind of elastic and energetic and seeming to become vast and small and, you know, all these things going on that I'd never Heard about or read about and didn't speak to anyone about and then and then uh, puberty hit and <laughs> forgot about that but uh, you know when I started meditating when I was 20 it began to emerge again and you know I do yoga and pranayama and meditation and you know the the, the <clears throat> by energy body um, you know that's just the subtle sensation we'll just call it subtle sensation and and uh, you know I had read about it and thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, but very exotic and not something I would ever experience, energy centers or whatever, or, you know, energy flows. But sure enough, you know, uh, they began to happen. And, <clears throat> you know, when I was training as a therapist, uh, beginning to sit with people, I began to notice, like, I could resonate emotionally with what was going on with the client. As In other words, I could feel it within myself, what they were describing. You know, and sometimes I would feel it before they would describe it, right? So it wasn't just I was, oh, I know what you mean. I've had that experience. I was picking it up in the field. You know, I could begin to feel anger. I could begin to feel shame. I could begin to feel contractions and openings. And, and so I began to use that in a, in a discreet way in my work with clients. And it's just developed ever since. It's unfolded. And, and so... More and more, it feels like the body, I recognize the body, the physical body, is um, <clears throat> just one level of experiencing the body, that there, there are subtler levels to it, mm. not, just, not just in terms of musculature and bones and you know, uh, tissue and cells, but in terms of just sensitivity as well. And so the body just increasingly feels um, spacious and energetic as well. And... And it's part of the intimacy of life as well. And so even though there's a clear, there's no, there's no confusion or rarely any confusion between what's being experienced here and what's being experienced there. You know, I, I mean, I know if I'm angry, I know it's not you that's angry, you know, something like that. I can, there is that discernment, but there's a, there's a, um, uh, easily available resonance. Um, when someone else is in dialogue and when they're really open. If they're not in dialogue and they're not open, it's like uh, I'm not sensing what they're experiencing. So it's almost like there needs to be permission you uh -huh. know, for this to work. Although that's not entirely true as I say it, because sometimes like if I'm just walking down a street and there's some person who's really suffering, you know, a street person or something, I can feel it, you know, I get like a wave of, of depression or despair, you know, will pass through me. But it, that's what it's like. It's just like things passing through, you know, it's like being an open, open, um, like an open room, you know, with open windows and doors and, you know, a breeze will come through and I'll feel it and then it will pass, 
and uh, we'll be gone. So it's more like that. So we all have this native sensitivity, some of us more than others. Um, it can be developed to some extent, particularly with um, like Qigong or Tai Chi or yoga. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's a matter of paying attention, you know, shifting attention from here down into the torso and interior of the body. And uh, gradually, you know, over the years, we just become more sensitive. And it's also related to our being in touch with our emotions, too. Uh, so the more we're willing to actually feel our feelings and sense our sensations, the more they come into the foreground of awareness as well. There's a fluidity of, of that experience. Mm. So, and there are all sorts of levels. You know, they're described in Tibetan Buddhist, Buddhist practice and, and Hindu yoga as well in terms of energy centers and, and um, you know, a central channel, mm. you know, the sense of core life energy that we're touching a little bit in our conversation yeah. uh, as well. And, yeah. you know, people feel it, it's not the most important thing, I would say, and sometimes people get fixated on trying to be sensitive that way. It's not, uh, I don't think it's that important, uh, but, but that was my, it was interesting to me because when I would sit with people and they would, you know, drop in and deepen and get in touch with their truth, they would begin to feel things in their body, right, that were surprising but validating, that sense of relief and that sense of oof, settling and <clears throat> opening up, feeling more alive and, and open-hearted and spacious. And so it was very valuable. I think the reason why I wrote the book is like to alert people that the body's responding to an unfolding truth. And that if they can't trust their minds, they can, the body's much more trustworthy in that regard. And, and for me, it was very helpful too, because I've been very skeptical. You know, um, that's my tendency over many decades. And so, you know, trusting the body, the body wisdom, if you will, is, is an important adjunctive resource. Mm. Yeah. And uh, as you talk about it, I kind of uh, get the sense of like, um, an instrument, you know, like we, we can become an instrument and why it's so important for practitioners, you know, whether you're a therapist or a, a teacher or a coach to have done mm. this work, because if we haven't, you know, um, um, done the work needed and, and dropped into our bodies and, and being able to metabolize a lot of that conditioning that covers um, our beingness, then, That's right. then there's too many signals in the way or, or we're too numb or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, either it's too noisy or we're, we're, it's too numb. Mm. Yeah. And so, you know, generally it's a process of, of uh, going through that. And as you say, metabolizing, digesting that and releasing it, keeping what's valuable and releasing what's not, you know. And so we feel freer and clearer, you know, as a vehicle, right, or, or as a musical instrument also. You know, one of my, my core spiritual teachers, uh, who was a European, Jean Klein, uh, lived in France many years. And he was a musician, in, in addition to being a medical doctor and an awakened being. And uh, he would often refer to the body being like a musical instrument. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have to actually kind of pull it out and take it out of the closet and clean it up and, you know, pay attention to it. And it becomes more and more finely tuned as we pay attention. And, uh, and then it becomes a resonant instrument for deeper essential qualities and energies, archetypal energies, I would say, in life. And so, you know, we coming back to, you know, often we talk about purpose in life and finding one's purpose. And um, what happens in this process, I find, in the letting go and the opening, it's like our natural gifts shine. Um, and with much less uh, attachment to the outcome as well. And there's something beautiful in that. It's like we feel well used, you know, and, and there's, an intrinsic, there's an intrinsic meaning to our life. Like being in the present, in presence, I should say, and living from that, you know, and sharing, you know, in a more spontaneous and, and intimate way is so fulfilling. You know, the gifts just naturally kind of come out and express themselves, but unselfconsciously and non-strategically. And the, the inner feeling is, is one of being well used by life, being an instrument for a, a greater current, you know, that moves through us. 
what I like about this is, you know, in my early spiritual days, I kind of, when I read about enlightenment and, you know, I started reading spiritual books, it was, it was a kind of a little bit depressing because I, I had this feeling that I had to, um, you know, become this kind of um, almost like blank uh, slate where I had no um, desires or, you know, I didn't really do anything. You know, I, I remember the first Krishnamurti book I, I read. I mean, and this was good as well because it was that was already starting to work on me in some ways. But it just, mm. I just was like, am I just going to sit in a room somewhere and never do anything because it's all pointless? You know, um, right? But actually, like, so what I hear you talk about is and is has been my own experience too. More is like there's there's this aliveness that comes online and. And that, yes. it, that we can become a conduit for it, or it, it's expressed through us, you know. And that's right. It's, it's very um, fulfilling, and, and there's a sense of natural purpose that's not a grasping or a needing to be seen or approved of in some exactly. way. But it, yeah, so it's very, yeah, very, very inspiring. Yeah, so often there are two. This is an important point in, in our conversation because very often the first step is an emptying out step. You know, it's like we're getting rid of what's false, you know, all, all the images, all the stories, you know, all our need to be validated and verified. And, and we face, you know, you know, we face a kind of emptiness uh, in our core. And so it's a stripping away and it, it can be difficult, you know, if we're honest about it. And it can be daunting as well, because a lot of these teachings, Krishnamurti and others, um, you know, that kind of point to that emptying out. And, and yet, that's step one, you know, that's the via negativa. You know, that's the not this, not this, not this, I'm none of this, right? I'm just this openness that I can't describe. Right? And, uh, and we do see because these teachings tend to come out of Eastern renunciate traditions, you know, which formulated 1000s of years ago, in part because life was short and difficult, right? And so you want to kind of get out of, transcend this, right? You know, you want to, you know, if you're a Buddhist, you know, you, you know, you talk about cessation of suffering and, and, uh, you know, if you're more, more Hindu, it's about transcending and getting beyond into some exalted state, but it's not so much about really being, you know, fully, immersed and engaged in the way that um, we as Westerners are required to do. So often in the, these traditions bring, speak of enlightenment as something very rarefied and remote from ordinary life. However, you know, that's just kind of step one. Step two is re-engaging in a different way, right? Re-engaging with less and less story you know, about who we are and who we're supposed to be and how this is and how this is supposed to be and engaging freely, you know, engaging creatively uh, and, and intimately. And I think this is the evolution, too, that's happening in, you know, the, uh, as we as Westerners and some Easterners, too, uh, look back at these traditional teachings and, and take what's beautiful and important in them and also... Um, keep working with them and applying them to our, you know, ordinary busy lives. So, yeah, there's very often, and, and like you, you know, I, I was reading Krishnamurti when I was 19 and, you know, reading about the great yogis and kind of fascinated, but kind of thinking that's pretty exotic and, and not for me. But there was always this sense of spirituality being extraordinary. But what I've discovered is just how ordinary this is. You know, it doesn't make you special. It, it actually frees us from our need to be special. Right. That's, and that's such a relief, you know, not to have to be special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It frees us to, uh, yeah, to really be present and engaged in our lives. Well, again, I just think of my own life of that. I, actually, you know, it was pretty, pretty painful when I started to see how a lot of the things I was doing underlying that was, was, was it was driven by a need to be special or to be to be seen yeah. uh, to be approved of and that I was never going to live in the way you described before of that natural kind of authentic for giving of my gifts and myself to life 
because that need to be seen and approved of always came from uh, it created a sense of contraction and tightness and in my body too like so that that's why i think it's so important to work with your body yes that's right yeah because we feel all of that somatically you know and the it's it's so interesting because our thoughts feelings and sensations are a complex they're interrelated and uh, these contractions that we feel somatically are directly related to this process that you're talking about of trying to prove or disprove something about ourselves all based on a sense of a separate self right which we haven't explicitly named in our conversation you know all of this where we've talked about as an egoic orientation but basically you know we're conditioned to take ourselves as a separate self and that's a very um that's a very insecure uh position you know to be disconnected from everything right so we're constantly in anxiety and and particularly socially as human beings are very sociable so we're constantly needing reinforcement and am i okay am i okay and, and let me prove that i'm you know that i'm fine and so it is it's like a straitjacket you know on our life energies and our attention and until we examine it you know and really go deeply into it we're going to live like that you know we're going to live in a contracted way and so including the body uh is actually quite important and it helps us get out of the images and ideas and and much closer to our direct experience so so in a sense that's why it's important to and i think you i read about this in your book that we need to open to the kind of um you know awareness and and to kind of the ground of being that we are to get some sense of experience of that and that can then allow all the contractions and the conditioning to to surface and be integrated or something that's right so it's a, it's our it's our primary resource the ground of being you know this awareness that's always here regardless of what we're experiencing and the more it's recognized you know the more the sense of we can relax in and as this awareness regardless of what's happening and then this becomes like the holding the great holding environment for you know our conditioned body mind to begin to relax into and you know to release to integrate to metabolize as well so if we've had trauma in the back in in our past you know very often in this process at some point it will get flushed out you know and need to work it through if we've had difficult relationships you know with our primary caretakers you know and and created certain bonds or lack you know in difficulty creating bonds in relationship those will start coming up as well to be examined and released as well and you know as human beings we're deeply conditioned and and we need to be conditioned in order to function and we carry all sorts of conditioning on all kinds of levels so there's no end to the process mm. of deep conditioning but our relationship to our conditioning changes you know it's not it's less and less a self improvement project you know trying to perfect ourselves it's much more relaxed much more compassionate much more affectionate we're we're much more accepting you know ourselves as we are and and in that in that um loving and accepting environment towards ourselves things tend to unfold much more easily mm. and uh, and then we extend it quite spontaneously to others as well well that's something i often i find myself doing with my clients is that um there's often this orientation they have that thing there's a problem you know it's like a kind of there's something missing that should be here or uh there's a problem a sense of scarcity uh, and right. it's like it's 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 kind of and then they create a sense of agitation or or disconnection right. from themselves and That's then right. that part of the work i want to be doing is helping them to to come back into a sense of the, of what you called alignment or it's mm -hmm. it's like being where you are in this moment and uh, what if it wasn't a problem you know and then that's right everything starts to settle or to to um to clear or and and then this sense of connection to this clarity or this inner knowingness can start that's to right. emerge again where it's almost like coming from the inside out you know it's like exactly yeah that's exactly how it is mm -hmm. yeah beautiful yeah it's like is there really a problem are you really a problem you know 
because that that gets to not you know because we we face challenges all the time difficult situations some which we can resolve some that we can't but the question is are we a problem right right you know do we hold ourselves as a problem do we hold ourselves as something that needs to be fixed or changed in a fundamental way and this is an important distinction and and it comes up often in my conversations with students and clients it's like is there anything essentially wrong or missing in you right. essentially is the the operative word here because we all have our shortcomings mm. we have our flaws we have our wounds it's not to deny you know that there are uh, horrible conditions you know the, in the world and that we, we've been exposed to uh, and certainly people we know have been exposed to so it's not to be in denial of that but are we fun the question is you know, is there a fundamental wholeness here already, regardless of what we've experienced, no matter what we've gone through, right? Is there a fundamental wholeness that's here? And can we contact this and rest and relax into it? And the answer is yes, always, regardless. This is what's so interesting. Regardless of what anyone's experienced, it's here, and it's the great resource as well. Sometimes people are afraid to open to it, you know, and, and that requires some navigating as well. Um, but as we know it better in ourselves, we can guide others into it as well. Yeah. So that's where it's very relational, too. Well, I'd love to ask you about that, the, this sense of um, meeting on, the, on, a, on a deep, intimate level that I think um, if you can meet in that, in that wholeness together and if the if the teacher or the therapist can, or the coach can, um, and maybe this comes back to my question of transmission, I don't know, but it's like if you can embody that place and, and help your client to meet in that place, and then there's this very deep meeting that can take That's place. Right. So I wonder if you could speak about that a little, a little bit. So even though you know, we're different on so many levels. You know, we have different thoughts and different feelings and different life experiences and different memories and points of view. We share something fundamental, you know, this ground of being. The awareness that's looking out through your eyes right now is no different than what's looking out here. As individuated, as distinct as we are, on the level of form, on the level of formlessness, formless awareness, it's the same awareness here. So that's, that's an intellectual proposition and a pointing. Then there's the experiential part. So we sit here okay, and we explore whether this is true in our direct experience. You know, is it possible? that what we're calling Joel and John, you know, are different forms or expressions of this one ground of being or awareness. And we sit in silence, you know, we, we gaze in innocently, openly. thousands of miles apart. <laughs> how, does, how does this work? You know? And I can feel, I can feel my heart open. Like literally can feel that space open and say, there's that radiance of the heart, right? That spaciousness. Right? So now we're, you know, we're in experientially an essential meeting with one another. Hmm. Knowingly. I mean, we have been all along. This is just, we get a little quieter, we bring attention to it. It's like, oh yeah, this is true in my experience. And the heart, this is the heart wisdom, right? This is the knowing, the inner knowing of the heart, right? This this quality of love, you know? There's this radiance, this recognition. So, how do we talk about this? 
Yeah. You know, you can speak of it as essential meeting, as co-presencing, of being, recognizing itself. That's a nice way to talk about it. Mm. You know, we can speak of it as love. That's the experience I had when you started to point to the experience was of, of um, yeah, the, the incredible intimacy of, of being looking at itself. That's it. That could come through to, yes, to like John and Joel, but mm-hmm. the, the, it, the, the feeling of intimacy is incredibly profound. It's, um, it is. It's not- almost heartbreaking or something like the, yeah. yeah. It's bigger than the heart can, the human heart can handle, you know, and, and this is the beauty. It's like heart just keeps breaking open, you know, there, there's great depths to the heart, you know, there's great depths to intimacy, um, which occasionally we may glimpse, you know, in someone we feel we really love and that we're close to. But so here we are, we've had a conversation for less than an hour, you know, and here it is. So it's actually any anyone who's a little bit open, you know, and available can experience this with someone else as well. And it also we begin to feel it not only with one another, you know, but it generalizes. We begin to feel it with life in general. Huh. To from this kind of open heartedness, open hearted awareness. And what's that like for you? Is it like then there's a sense of um you know, like being in flow and, and, and a sense of maybe, um, how do I put it? Like, I, I don't want to say okayness because that sounds a bit too detrimental, but a benevolence or a... Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the right, there's the right words. Like all is well, no matter what. Right. That's the feeling. Not ignoring suffering at all. In fact, this is the interesting thing. As the heart opens like this, you know, we feel... I feel, and and I know this is true for others, we feel others suffering acutely. We don't suffer so much ourselves anymore. You know, that sense of suffering from being a separate self, cut off and disconnected and confused, and all of that tends to fall away. But we feel the suffering of others individually and collectively as well. And there's a sense of it being held, you know, in something much greater than the little me. You know, there's, I call it the great heart. You know, it's like just something much greater, loving and compassionate is holding all of this uh, as well. Mm. Yeah. And you find that in people that that can correspond very much to the area, you know, in the body where we dissociate the heart and and that can be like, yeah. Yeah. Center of the chest. You know, I call it the heart area as well. It's like everyone... You know, everyone has this capacity. It's native to every human being, inherent mm. as well. Well, we, you talked about in your book these signs of, of, um, of this inner knowingness being there. Like, um, I can't memorize them, but like, I think, well, open-heartedness was one of them and That's right. groundedness and spaciousness. Right. And there was another. I wonder if we could yeah. Yeah, talk a bit more I'll about touch- it. Touch on those, yeah. yeah. So we've been just experiencing the open-heartedness part, right? right. So uh, there's that. And then, um, yeah, the groundedness is very interesting. Um, the, the whole theme of what is the ground and what is grounding, uh, for me, has been a kind of special interest because, um, you know, I was talking earlier about this kind of contraction, that ways that we try to hold ourselves up and in, and, and, and we're kind of standing on a false ground. I would say the ground of an egoic ground, a separate self. And that's just always shaky, you know, and it's going to, the bottom's going to fall out at some point. And we know it, you know, we know that this little project is going to end at some point, the me project, and not to mention the body project as well. And that's very ungrounding to the separate self. But if we actually let ourselves kind of be ungrounded, you know, which sometimes feels like a free fall we begin to open up to what feels like this vast open ground that we're held by something, a groundless ground, you know, something that's unimaginable to the mind. 
and there's a deep relaxation that happens. So we feel grounded in the sense of just like deeply relaxed and in our body, you know, but we can't actually localize <laughs> the ground. So as people drop into their truth more and more deeply into the, tr the truth of their being, the sense of ground deepens and opens mm. as well. They can feel that uh, somatically. So also, as there's this experience of feeling upright, and um, when we start getting in touch with what's deeply true, we start feeling the sense of alignment, of vertical alignment. It's like things coming into, you know, this yeah. kind of alignment. And, and with that is also a feeling of aliveness. And we've been touching that feeling of aliveness. There's great vitality, a kind of core aliveness or vitality um, that that's, we can feel sometimes as a downpouring current, sometimes as an upwelling current. It goes in both directions. Uh, so that's not uncommon either. Um, as we and, and you just kind of sit up a little bit straighter as you begin to you know, feel that sense of alignment. So that's common. Um, and then the sense of just openness and space with inside the body, which is like the body feels more relaxed and open and spacious, but we begin to feel like, gosh, you know, who I am is not just limited to this body. I can, I can feel myself almost a little bit bigger than this body, almost like there's space around my body. And, and that can develop until, you know, we feel like a big space, you know, and then we feel ourselves as that big space. Uh, as well, I'm not confined to the body. It's not that we aren't the body, but we're not. We're not only the body. Mm. You know, we feel a sense of more and more openness and spaciousness. So, um, these are some of the most common aspects that you know I've noticed. And some people will feel, you know, one maybe, and only one, and others will feel a couple and various combinations. And I think of them as different facets, you know, uh, of the same knowing. And uh, not that we need to feel them. The other thing is that not only are they kind of um, signals or signs, but they're also portals. So mm -hmm. when we feel this open heartedness, we can actually deepen into it, explore it with curiosity. You know, we feel the sense of space. We can explore that. We feel a sense of deepening ground or, you know, more and more verticality and alignment. We just kind of breathe into it, feel into it. And we discover it's like they all lead to the same place, too. They're all expressions, bodily expressions of this inner knowing. And they all point uh, to it and are portals to it as well. So you can enter, you know, through any of those portals, sense of aliveness, alignment, groundedness, open heartedness, spaciousness. They all lead, you know, and because they, they all lead to the same place because they all come from the same place as well. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty. And so more and more, we rest as this knowing, you know, it's not that we know something, we are the knowing itself, you know, we are the knowing and, and um, as an awake awareness is another way to speak of it, this natural wakefulness. I love that kind of little, <laughs> the little guide through those different aspects, because I could feel them coming to the foreground of my experience as you talked about them. And I guess what comes up for me now, I notice, is, you know, you talked about this, the, the knowingness, which there the, the can be this, this kind of spacious awareness or ground of being we talked about. But mm -hmm. the, there also seems to be a, I don't know if I would call it a personal element to it, but it's like the truth for, you know, the, the truth for us is all is different in some way. So... Um, even though there's a universal truth, um, there seems to be like, you know, with each client that you may have. A subjective truth, a exactly. truth for that, an individual truth. Yeah. It's like, what's true for you? You know, that's right. Like, what's true for this particular individual, you know, right. for right now, right? Right. Exactly. And that's like what I'm, I guess I'm curious about the link between those. And I guess in some way it's mysterious. It's very mysterious. And we've been talking about it also all throughout our conversation. And right now I notice that's what comes to my, it's like mm -hmm. there is something impersonal and incredibly personal about it. 
I, yeah, depending on, yeah, I know what you mean. You're right. I, I think of it as uh, impersonal and intimate. Mm -hmm. um, but the language is not so important, you know, I'm, it, depending on what we mean by personal. And I know what you mean by personal. It's just like, it just feels right for me right now. You know, this is what feels true for me. And uh, it's different than the the kind of grasping mind or the desire or impulse. It's different than impulsivity. Um, because we know because impulses are repetitious, you know, they're kind of a reflex, habitual reflex. There's a quality of grasping to them. Um, and and uh, this has a different feel to it. You know, it's not, that's the kind of the impersonal part of it or the less personal. And yet it's very intimate. It's a the quality of aliveness and realness mm. to it and, and um, suitability for the moment um, right. as well. It's, it's funny because in a way, you, you just know, yeah? You just know when, like when someone's in that place too, you know? If you're sat opposite a client or just somebody you meet, if they're, if they're connected to their own, I mean, you talked about being real, you know, and I think if they're being real and they're connected to a certain truth, you can just tell, you can just feel it immediately. Uh, it's like you don't this have to think a, about it. No, we have a sense of authenticity in ourselves and in others as well. And there are different levels of authenticity, aren't there? Someone may be emotionally authentic. They're having a very difficult experience and they're not trying to hide it, you know, so, and, and we respond to that, you know, to that kind of emotional, there can be intellectual authenticity. And then there's the authenticity of being, you know, being who we really are. And we can sense that too. Mm. That in us, which is authentically being, senses it in another as well. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It is, yeah. Well, How connected we really are, right? Fundamentally, not just interconnected, like breathing the same air and sharing the DNA. That's one level. But we're, we're speaking of an essential connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like where, where does, what is that connection? You know, it's like in some sense, um, it goes from the gross down to something so subtle that it's everywhere or it's put, I don't know. Yeah, it's that's like right. it's, you, can't, you can't grasp it. Well, that's it. It's, uh, you know, and that's what we refer to as non-separateness or non-duality mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, this is the, these are the teachings I've gravitated to over the years, you know, that pointing to that non-separateness, that essential non-separateness, that not to you know, or, or non-duality. Mm. You can speak of it as oneness, too. But again, the words aren't so important. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I'm sat here with gratitude um, for, for the chance to be able to connect with you and to, to speak about this, um, these topics. And yeah, no, it's, it's been lovely. And, and gratitude is a very, I find, um, gratitude is really one of the spontaneous byproducts of, of recognizing this. It's just, you know, more and more, I, I just feel grateful for no reason. <laughs> and it's, you know, and I feel grateful to share on the level that we are as well. You know, it's, it's beautiful. So, yeah. So I, I, I too feel great. Yeah. What, what I notice is how, um, you know, I think we talked about this flow or um, the kind of benevolence of life. It's like, it just seems so appropriate for my journey to be having this conversation with you. It's like, it's part of that. It's part of my path, my unfolding. I, I can feel that sense right now as we speak. Exactly. There you go. There is an obviousness, you know, you, for some reason you read the book and for some reason you reached out and for some reason I said yes, you know, and uh, without much thought about it. Mm -hmm. So it's part of an unfolding flow and, and it's quite mysterious, but quite beautiful to trust this and follow it. Yeah. Got a big smile on my face. Um, <laughs> I think I, at least I think I have. It feels like I have. <laughs> It's certainly a big inner smile. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> so um, I want to, yeah, just just want to just express that gratitude again. Thank you very much for.
for being available to speak. Yeah.